All right, welcome. Uh, in this video, I'd like to talk about the Lentil Ziv Welch uh, data compression algorithm uh, as a second alternative data compression algorithm uh, to the Huffman algorithm that we looked at in a previous uh, video. So let's uh, recall that one of the benefits of the Huffman algorithm uh, is that it's going to give us codes that are optimal uh, given a couple of reasonable uh, assumptions, but assumptions that uh, we can violate, and that's going to be the principle that we're going to use today. Because uh, one of the assumptions that is made to prove that, that again, that Huffman is optimal is the assumption that each character will be assigned a code word. And that's, that's going to be true of our next uh, model as well, except that we're also going to assign code words to sequences of characters. In particular, we're going to look at common sequences of characters, and so here I've listed a few of them. Uh, if we were able to assign a code word to one of these longer sequences, it might give us some savings. And this is something that is prohibited, at least in the proof, that shows that Huffman codes are optimal. And what that means is we're pro we might be able to violate this optimality because by violating one of the assumptions, it means we are not under uh, that we're not under the scope of that proof, meaning that proof does not apply to this method. So the method that we're going to look at here, I'm going to give you a, a sort of a motivation or example here. Let's say we start, let's say we were reimagining the ASCII table. Now maybe we're doing it today, um, and maybe we aren't so worried about including a bunch of emojis, but we want to do some efficient coding. We might fill in the first uh, bunch of slots with the standard characters, but then we might say, hey, why don't we add some coding for common uh, English you know, substrings or English words that are very common um, that we can encode uh, you know, with fewer bits. Uh, for instance, if the word the was included in the table, uh, it would only take 8 bits, since we're assuming we're doing an ASCII table, 8 bits. Instead of using uh, normal 24 bits, if we encoded the T, the H, and the E each as a... Uh, a character uh, uh, by itself. So if we were going to do this, we pose, we may maybe face the question, well, how do we decide which, uh, which common sequences we should add into our table? And this is sort of a question that we're going to face in this, uh, in this algorithm as well. Now, there's sort of two quick, uh, quick answers here. Um, the first one is, well, maybe we know uh, something about the English language, and so I've sort of pulled these ones out as examples just because uh, I know these are common sequences in the English language just because I've, I've written lots of English words and these show up a lot. Um, but we're actually going to use a, a more uh, focused principle, maybe, where we're going to pull the message itself. We're going to say, well, just because a sequence, you know, just because the is common in English doesn't mean um, that uh, we're going to encounter it very much in the me message that we are uh, reading. Maybe the message we're reading doesn't encounter the word or doesn't contain the word the at all or that substring at all. Maybe it's in a different language. Maybe it doesn't, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it just happens to be the type of, uh, maybe it's a numerical, uh, maybe it's data, so mostly what we're getting is numbers, and these common strings don't show up at all. So what we would want is our directory that we're building to somewhat be dependent on the data that's coming in. If we're getting numerical data, we'd want to have lots of common sequences of, of numbers. Uh, if we're getting no numerical data, but we are getting English words, then we might want substrings like this. So the technique that we're going to look at is actually going to uh, uh, try and be sensitive to the common sequences that we find in the message itself. In particular, the more common a sequence is, the, more, the longer uh, we might encode it. So if we get uh, common short sequences, but if we have common long sequences, um, the more common it is, the more likely it will be encoded by our uh, algorithm. Let's take a closer uh, look now. Um, one thing I will mention about this algorithm is uh, we call it maybe the lempel ziv algorithm or the lempel ziv welch algorithm. And that's due to its history, uh, and its history, as is the history of some more of the modern algorithms that you might encounter, is one where it's been developed by maybe a, not just a single researcher or even just a team of researchers, but maybe a, uh, a collection of researchers over time have made improvements to the algorithm, made changes to it um, that are worth you know worth reporting. 
Um, that's true of this particular uh, data compression algorithm. Uh, I'm going to be presenting a version uh, due to uh, Welch uh, from 1983, uh, though the original versions of the Lempel-Ziv compression were presented in 1977 and 1978 in a pair of papers uh, by Lempel and Ziv. And so sometimes we use this type of shorthand. This might be a uh, this might be how you would refer to the paper that uh, was published, uh, you know, Lempel and Ziv in 1977 or Lempel and Ziv in 1988. Well, we'll sometimes use that shorthand to refer to the actual algorithm that was presented there uh, if we want to talk about subtle differences between the different versions of the algorithm. So uh, I'm not uh, very familiar with these original versions uh, because I myself have studied Welch's version, which was published a little bit later. Uh, where some simplifying adjustments were made where where my expectation at least is these two methods are just slightly more complicated in their implementation or the way that they are carried out whereas Welch noticed hey we could simplify this here and we could simplify this here uh, and as a result he sort of distilled out a, a nice easy to understand variant of the same type of algorithm. Now since 1983 a number of variants have also been introduced since Welch um, that also maybe make adjustments in, in uh, one way or another. Uh, I am going to you know, rely on Welch's version uh, because I think it's the simplest version. Some of these other ones make more complicated adjustments uh, that again might improve some aspects of it. Uh, and today uh, you might expect some variant of this algorithm being used, uh, but probably not uh, just the simple version due to Welch in 1983. All right, so uh, one, a couple shifts from Huffman that I want to highlight now. Well, we'll be relying on a directory of characters. That's the same thing that we uh, started out with in Huffman. But we're actually going to rely on fixed length codes now. So uh, in Huffman, we switched to variable length codes. That came with some challenges. We saw how Huffman was able to tackle those challenges. Well, now we're going to switch back to fixed length code, mainly to rely on, on the simplicity of decoding that we get with a fixed length code. Now, the codes that we're going to have are going to be codes attached to a single character or cat, uh, codes attached to uh, sequences of characters. And so the way that we're going to do this is we're going to initialize our directory by selecting a bit width. So since it's a fi fixed length code, we're going to select how many bits in that length. Maybe it's a uh, eight bits is like the ASCII table. However, a lot of our, a lot of our compression might just start with the ASCII table itself. Uh, as its initial directory, meaning we'll probably want a bit width longer than 8, then 9, 10, 11, and so on. Um, in our examples, though, we're not going to start with the whole ASCII table. That's just going to clog our table up with a lot of useless characters. Instead, we're going to restrict ourselves down to a much smaller table, uh, again, just for our examples. Although, in practice, we might use the whole ASCII table, especially if we don't know what kind of data we have coming in. Okay, so I, I do want to take a look at the algorithm. Uh, it's presented here in some simple pseudocode. Um, so here I've called it LZW for Level Z Welch, um, taking in a message here M, but also I'm going to add the parameter B, which is the bit width. How many bits are we going to use for our directory? Um, now this is something we can use as a parameter, uh, although uh, we could also imagine a dynamic calculation of this, maybe an LZW that doesn't calculate the bit width, but instead um, maybe remains agnostic on the bit width, trying out different bit widths as it goes to try and optimize compression. And, and I'll to comment more about that at the end of the video. All right, so we uh, begin our uh, algorithm with some initialization. This first couple steps are all initialization. Uh, we're going to have R, which is going to be the empty string, and it's going to be used to store the encoded message at the end. At the end here, we're going to return R. <coughs> uh, we're going to have the directory. Uh, and the directory D, we're going to make use of it. We're going to initialize it, or we're going to declare it with enough space um, to store all of our 2 to the B entries, since we're going to rely on bit width B. And we're going to take every character, every unique character in our message M, and add it into our directory. Now this step uh, is one where we could either, if this was just uh, an understood step where we know that our all the initial characters are just going to be the ASCII table itself, 
then this step might be constant time. Or if the characters in the message are already known ahead of time, uh, maybe we know it's uh, an email message using mostly alphanumeric characters, uh, so we don't actually have to scan the message to, to determine that. However, um, if we do have to scan the message to determine every unique character, then this step may take order n. Now, we usually aren't worried about this step being an expensive step or a, or a cheap step because um, the loop we're about to do is also an order n loop. And so if, if this step also takes order n, well, we're already taking order n in this loop. Uh, so all we've done is increase the constant out front. Usually we're not as concerned about that. Uh, but, of course, if we can get away with a constant time initialization here, then we'll do that uh, to be uh, extra efficient. Okay, so the bulk of the algorithm is carried out by this loop. Uh, let's take a look at the loop here. In the loop, uh, again, we're going to repeat until m is empty. m is our uh, message here. And in, the message, in, in each iteration here, what we're going to do is we're going to encode one or more characters of m. Okay, so let's see how we do that. Well, we start here, we say let m, lowercase m now, be the longest prefix of our message, uppercase m, such that there is an entry for m in our directory d. Now, we can imagine this iteration either being sort of one of the first couple iterations or later on, maybe even near the end of our, our message. Early on, the longest prefix of our message that we're going to have an entry for is probably going to be a single character. Now remember, since every character was added in our initialization here, we know that at least the prefix will be at least, sorry, at least a length one. We can't, we aren't going to get in a case where we have no prefixes or rather the only prefixes of length zero uh, for which we have a directory entry. Uh, because we've initialized the directory to have every single character in it. So we know we'll get at least one. Now think later on in this loop, maybe there will be entries in our list that have uh, entries that are of length two or three or four characters long that also have entries in the directory. How did they get in there? Well, we'll see in a second, we might add them in. But at this point here, we're saying let M be this longest prefix. Maybe it's one character long, maybe it's more than one character long. Okay, so we grab this sequence off of this prefix off of our message and we're going to delete it from the message. Okay, so we've shortened the message now and we're also going to encode it. Now this step here is encoding it. I'm saying let r, remember r is the string that we're using to return. Uh, it's just going to be r plus here being concatenation plus d is our directory at entry m. So I'm going to take this, this prefix m that I've selected, I know it has an entry in d because that's how I've selected it. So I'm going to take that entry in d. What that means is d is going to tell me it's encoding in binary. So I'm going to take that binary, that bit string, and I'm going to add it to the end of uh, whatever bit string I've been accumulating in r here. So as we go, we add more and more uh, of these bit strings to the end of r. So these these sort of three steps here inside our loop. The first one is just finding this longest prefix m. Once we have it, we delete it from the message and we encode it into our encoded message. So this is all encoding. The last step here has to do with updating the directory. And this is sort of the clever bit of the lempel ziv algorithm. Here, now that we've encoded m, we've taken m off, the prefix m, we're going to still use it in this last step, but we've taken it off of m. So we're now going to look at, at the message, what's the next character to be encoded? And we're going to call that one w. Okay. We're going to compute the string mw, this is just concatenation. So remember, m is this prefix, it could be of any length, one or greater. And w is the next character. Now m was the longest prefix such that there was an entry. MW then must be the shortest prefix of the original message M here that did not have a directory entry. So remember, we're selecting the prefix at this step to be the longest one that does have a directory entry. So if we had added one more character to it, that one must not have a directory entry or we would have selected it in this step. So since we didn't select it in this step, this must be the shortest 
prefix that did not have a directory entry, well, at this step, we're going to add it into the directory. So it didn't have an entry before, now it does. So if we encounter this string again, we can now use the new directory entry when, when we encode it in this step here. Now, the last little bit here I added is if there is room. Well, sometimes our directory fills up. Uh, if our directory fills up, then effectively we don't do this fourth step here. We just do the first three steps. Um, and that's just straightforward encoding, which is saying look it up in the directory, find what this code word is, and encode it. That's very straightforward. Okay, the whole loop here, the whole repeat loop, is going to take order n steps, assuming we use a map to store our directory. And that's something that's important. I'm going to talk more about maps in a future video. Um, but for now, I assume we all have experience using maps, especially if we have experience coding in Java. We should probably have used a map before. Um, so if we, you know, if we use the map as it's designed, um, then we get order one access when we do our directory lookups and we do our, when we add elements to our directory. Uh, and if that's happening in constant time, then everything in here is constant time and we can go ahead and it's pretty straightforward to see that this is going to take about order n steps um, uh, to do the whole loop. All right, now remember what that means for us is that the whole encoding scheme will be order n. One pass over, well, maybe two passes over, remember if we had to go look up all the unique entries uh, in our message m. If we got away with doing that for free, or for constant time rather, then uh, this, this last pass over is going to be the bulk of our effort. Okay, to continue, I wanted to uh, once again, tackle our example string here. Anna has a banana in a bandana. And I do want to use that again. I'm going to use my LZW uh, algorithm here. Um, and we can imagine this is the initialization step where this is the directory that we're building. And I've initialized it uh, so that uh, each of the, the unique characters, A, B, D, H, and so on here, that appear in my message has been assigned a code word already. And as is typical for this algorithm, we usually just assign them the first uh, however many uh, code words are, are necessary. Now we had eight characters in this example message, so we're going to use eight, eight entries in our directory. Now I've actually chosen for my example to use a bit width of five. You'll, you'll notice or, you, or maybe you'll recall from our previous example that with only eight characters, we actually only need a bit width of three. But if we did use only a bit width of three, we would have perfectly filled up the directory and we would have no space left over to do any adds to the directory. Since that's the whole bulk of the algorithm, um, we would effectively just be using our three bit code with no additional compression. Now we already looked at how good the three bit code was. It was a pretty good code. Okay. Um, but um, we should select a, a, high, a larger bit width than three, probably, if we want to get any compression out of the LZW, LZW uh, compression technique. So that leaves us with a few other choices. Do we want four? Do we want five? Do we want six? Do we want eight? There's lots of values greater than our three that we could select. There's a, there's a sort of a trade-off here, and there's actually a sweet spot worth looking for. Now, I think the sweet spot for this example is five. I haven't looked very closely, but I'll comment on it as we go why I think it's five. But the sweet spot is going to be where you get the most compression, the best compression. Um, and it's usually going to be more than the minimum because you want to have some, you want to have, you want to allow the algorithm to have time to carry out its, you know, take advantage of its benefits. Um, but then you don't want it to be too large because every time you add a bit to the width of your bit width, every code word that you encode now gets longer and longer. Okay. So here I picked five. I think it's the sweet spot, meaning it's going to get the best compression for our example here. But uh, I leave it to you as an exercise. Try a couple different bit widths and see if you get a better, uh, better compression than I do. Uh, okay, so again, we started out all eight of our entries are here. Um, and we've initialized them with our first uh, eight values. Now the first step in our in our loop now is to take the longest prefix of M here that we already have an entry for. Well now again I'm going to comment I'm going to repeat this comment. 
that our initialization, we only have single characters in here. So this first step will only ever be a single character. And in fact, for a while, until we see a repeated sequence of length two, like a n a n again, we're probably going to only encode single characters. So at the beginning of the algorithm, we usually are doing straightforward encoding. What's take, what is happening at the beginning of the algorithm is we're filling in our directory, and, we'll, and that's what we want to focus on here. So A is going to be encoded as 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5 zeros. Uh, and then the next entry is going to be A, whatever we encoded, plus the next character, which is N. So the, the next entry we're going to add into our directory is A, N. Okay. So again, just seeing the result here, we've encoded A. This is our, I've got this E of M, but it was what I was calling R in the, uh, in the algorithm. The encoded message here, we pop out just one code word, 0000, which we know is an A, but we've added A N to the directory. Now we don't use this on the first step, but if we encounter A N again down the road, then we'll be able to encode both of the characters as 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Now, of course, that's the benefit of the algorithm. That's why we're, we're doing this. So hopefully, let's, you know, let's pay attention. When we get down there, we should be able to make use of this code word. But for the moment, now again, we look up n. n is in our directory, but n, n is not in our directory. So again, we have to encode n as 5, it looks like here. And then, then we'll add n n to the directory. So we encode n is five, and we add n n to the directory. And again, if we were to encounter n n later, then we would be able to reuse this. Okay, so let's continue. Maybe going a little quicker now. So n is the longest prefix because we haven't encountered n a yet. So we will encode n as five, and we will add n a to the directory. Okay, continuing and being careful to not ignore my space here. Uh, we've now gonna get the A, but the, the next uh, entry in here will be A space. Okay, again, encoding A is all zeros, A space. Okay, uh, space uh, H, haven't encountered that sequence before, so space will be encoded just as uh, seven, uh, and we'll add space H N. So again, we're looking for for sequences we haven't encountered. H is already in our directory, but HA we haven't encountered yet, so that's going to be added in uh, while we just encode H uh, as a single character. AS, we've encountered an AN before, we've encountered an A space before, but no ASs, so again our A is going to go in as just all zeros, and we're going to add AS to our directory. Okay, continuing. Uh, S, haven't encountered S before. Well, this is our first one. S space we'll add into our uh, directory here. And uh, we'll go to the next one. Now space A, we haven't encountered space A yet. The other thing is, it looks like I've run out of space in my directory, but I haven't quite because I haven't added the second half of my directory yet. So my second half of my directory is all the values starting with uh, a leading one here. So I'll now add space A into my directory. Now actually, here's our first chance to make use of something we've encountered before. We have our, our, our current message M. We have our prefix of A, which we know, of course, is in the directory. But A space we have encountered before, and it is in our directory. So now we're going to, we're going to consume two characters in this next step encoding it here as, what's this, 11. And now we'll add A space B into our directory. So again, using 11 here to encode two characters at once, we'll add A space B into the directory. And that consumed two characters of our message. So we get some savings here. Now before this, each one of these five bit chunks encoded one character that we've consumed. But this one consumed two. So we sort of got a savings here of five bits, if you will. Okay, let's push on. B, this is our first B. So we know that BA hasn't uh, occurred in our, in our message yet. So we will add it now. 
and we'll encode B just as one. So we encode B as one, add BA to our list. AN, that is something that's going to be in our directory before. A, we know is in our directory, but so is AN. ANA is not in our directory, but we will add it in this step. So again, we're going to encode AN as eight, eight, consuming two characters at once and adding ANA to our directory. We actually get a little bit lucky here. The word banana is built for this uh, type of encoding uh, because now we get ANA. Okay, now ANA was exactly the last thing we added to our directory. This is again, unlikely usually we don't get to do this but banana is a, just a special uh, word that gives us this ability we now get to add the next entry a n a space okay and if this was a longer sentence we'd probably get that later on a n a space okay but we got our a n a we've consumed those three characters all at once uh, and now we've got a space space i uh, it looks like that's not one we've encountered before, so that will be our next entry in our directory. All right, I, uh, I N, looks like it's the next entry. Uh, again, we haven't encountered that yet, so we'll add that in. N, we've encountered Ns before, but no N spaces before, so we'll add that one in. Now, space A, we do have a space A, so we'll consume that two of them, that is two characters at once, and encode that as, what's this one here, it looks like uh, 16. Okay, so notice we've now added space A space into our directory. This is something that you would probably encounter if you were encoding, say, an English, you know, some kind of English language message, uh, because this word is so common that we've now basically said that you know, this word is so common that we might as well encode it as such um, so that later on when we encounter it, uh, we get savings. Again, now we're saving, uh, if we were to use this, uh, all three characters here, we've saved 10 bits now over the 15 bits we might use. Okay, let's complete our example. Um, so we've now consumed our space A. We still have the space B here. Now, this is an, another interesting example. We just encountered, um, or we're just going through a sequence of characters A space B, and that's actually something we've encountered before. If we had skipped over this space, you know, if we had got lucky, we, we could have used this sequence. However, that's not how LZW works. We don't look ahead, we don't try and get advantageous. We're, we just go as we go. It's an online as you read in the characters, you process them. Uh, this is benefits us when we decode, as uh, maybe I'll comment at, at the end of the video. Um, but since we don't get this uh, skipping around or looking ahead or trying to you know, uh, pick the best codes, uh, we just get the ones as we go. Uh, even though we've encountered this space B before, since we consumed it in this earlier uh, processing, we don't actually have space B showing up in here. So we have encountered that pattern in our message before, but it was part of a different encoding step, so it doesn't exist in our directory. So now we have to add it. Okay, BA, hey, that was in our directory before, so BAN now is added. Now if it was a another banana here, we'd get some even more savings, but it's not, it's bandana. So do we have ND in there? No, of course, this is our first encountering of a D. So we'll encode the N as a single character, five, and we'll add ND to our directory. Okay, D again, this is our first D, so we have to encode it as it is, and add a DA to our directory. And then Finally, all we have left is Anna. Anna is in our directory, so we'll add it in. Now, at this step, we don't actually add any other character to our directory because we ran out of message. And usually, uh, in this, in our examples, we're either going to run out of message before we uh, run out of directory, or, of course, the vice versa case, we run out of directory before we run out of message. Okay, and both both cases run, you know, both of them run pretty much straightforwardly as you would example, or as you would uh, uh, guess in our example here. We ran out of our message, so we just stop. You don't need to encode anymore. 
If we run out of the directory and we still have message left, well, we just encode it using the directory that we have and the rest of the message. And usually, so I, I thought, or I said I was going to comment on my bit width choice. Why did I choose five, not four, or three? I said three was bad because we, we would have only had this directory. That's only our single characters. There's no savings there. Uh, four, why did I stop at four? Well, four I would have only got to here. And, you know, a few of the characters I used here were useful, A, N. I think that was the only one we used. But we might have used N, A again. But we actually consumed those ones uh, here. We actually got greater savings, or at least I hypothesized we got greater savings, by being able to make three, make use of this Anna. Okay, I don't know if we got actual greater savings or not, so I'm going to leave that as an exercise. Um, try this again. Cut it off here, okay, and uh, see if you get greater savings. You might. Okay, my, my brain's trying to crunch through some of the numbers right now, and it, it looks like it's favorable. So I'm thinking, go ahead and see, check it out yourself. Now, what is the difference? What is the difference between this encoding scheme and this other one that I'm suggesting? Well, here, let's quickly go through. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That looks like. Uh, ooh. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1, 2. It looks like we got, okay, so all told we got 22 uh, characters here. Each one is of length 5, okay, a little head math there. 20 times 5 is 100, so that's 20, 110, right? So we have 110 bits, okay. So what happens when we, we change to bit with 4? Bit with 4 means all of these five bit strings would become four bits. That sounds great, right? We just saved ourselves 22 bits. Okay, but what? What's the trade off? The trade off is some of these bit strings we use, we got to encode three characters at a time. This, when we use this Anna. And we probably aren't going to get that if we cut it off at four. So instead of having 22 uh, code, code words here, we might have more. We might have, say, 25. Well, 25 times 4 is still 100. That sounds like savings. So who knows? I want you to check. Maybe if it's more than 25, it could be more than 25. If it was 30, remember our, our whole message is 30. If it was 30, then uh, we probably wouldn't get savings. That's 120. So we know the number is somewhere between there, between those two values. So see if we get some savings. Okay. Now, I've done the calculations already for uh, for bit with five, we just did that together. We said we got 110 bits there. Well, if we compress that over the ASCII that we were considering as our base level, uh, that's a that's a 46 uh, percent, which wasn't as good as just using three bits or Huffman. So why not? Well, one of the reason is um, LZW works a lot better if we have a longer message. A longer message gives us more opportunity to take advantage of those longer sequences we've added to our directory. Um, imagine if we encountered the word banana a few times, if we've encountered it you know, enough times to add the word banana to our directory, then we would, uh, then later on in the message, we would be getting a lot of savings by encoding any, uh, any future occurrence of the word banana using that longer sequence. Now, of course, if we do not have any further account occurrences of banana in our message, then we're probably not going to get those savings. So uh, the LZW strategy is to sort of add things to our directory at the beginning, which makes our directory a little bit bulky. So on shorter messages, it might bulk up our message a little bit. But the goal on that is to have uh, the longer, or, or hopefully we have a longer message that's going to take advantage of that and get savings down the road. So in order to uh, express that a little bit more, I wanted to give a, a slightly different example. Now this one we're not going to do by hand, but this is one I did programmatically. Uh, to that end, I wrote a uh, quick Java program to do this. Not my favorite language and not the easiest way to do it, but I had some compression uh, stuff already written in Java, so I thought why not write, uh, write this one in Java as well. And I used this sample um, sample message. Uh, if you're a fan of Stephen King or Stanley Kubrick, there's a 
popular uh, movie The Shining from 1982, uh, in which uh, Jack Nixon plays uh, sort of a, a man tortured by alcoholism and his own ghosts, and he uh, is and he was a writer who would write uh, on this typewriter in, in the Overlook Hotel, and he would write all day. And then in a shocking scene, uh, his wife goes to look at what he was writing, thinking he was writing a novel. And what he had just written, typed over and over again on his page was all work and no play makes dull a Jack a dull boy. And so I went ahead and typed this into uh, a text file 512 times. Of course, I'm lying there. I wouldn't do that. That would be crazy. Um, what I did is I just cut and pasted 512 times, which is not too hard to do if you keep doubling up. Why did I get 512 times, not 500? Well, of course, I just doubled. I did a control A, control C, control V, just copy it all, cut it and paste it. After doing that a number of times, uh, I doubled it up to 512. I stopped at 512. Why? I don't know. I got lazy. Okay, that's two to the ninth. So I doubled it up nine times. Uh, okay, so once what you know again, why did I create that text file? Well, um, this this phrase by itself doesn't necessarily have too many uh, repeated. Uh, uh, characters. It has a couple double L's in there that might be useful. The A, of course, is showing up a number of times that might be useful. But what's going to happen after we encounter this 512 times is the entire sequence will have been repeated in that message so much that we could imagine maybe that entire sequence, if we have enough room in our directory, will have been added as uh, an entry to our directory, meaning in the next time we encounter it, we just use that that last version of the sequence over and over again, and we might be you know we might be compressing this whole message down to a single uh, code word, which of course would be great savings. So in a way, this text file was specifically designed to be uh, very well compressed by LZW. Maybe the only the only string that would be compressed even better by LZW, uh, and this is sort of a bizarre string to think about is a string of only one single character, like a string of all A's, but like a, a billion of them. That would be the most compressible string by LZW because every time you encounter a string of A's, you'll, you'll be able to encode the next one, which will be one bit longer. And again, you'll, you'll keep using that last code word you just created on your next step. Okay, so let's uh, see how compressing this long uh, text file with these 512 ver or copies of this string uh, actually uh, worked uh, using our different compression methods. So first off, um, just for the math that we're using for our ratio here, uh, the number of bits used in ASCII, just completing this, is a 43 characters long, 8 bits per character, times 512 copies of it, uh, got us this 176,000 bits. Uh, uh, with just five bits, or using Huffman, uh, we get sort of these types of compression. Uh, Huffman, again, is optimal, assuming a few assumptions, but remember LCW violates those assumptions. And I've just highlighted here that uh, at a bit width of 10, which is enough space to encode the whole message all the way to the bottom, and maybe have a few empty spaces in the directory, but not too many, um, we actually get uh, our optimal compression here of almost exactly 8%. Um, beyond that, here I, the, the brackets here the, on the left-hand side is telling us how many bits we actually used. Uh, so even though I set my bit width to 12, and we only actually used up to 11 bits before we ran out of directory. Uh, so these are all stating basically the compression ratio at 11 bits. At 11 bits here, we had a little extra wasted space in our directory, so we don't uh, we don't use it. Here maybe we completely filled up the directory, maybe had just a little bit of extra message left to, to, uh, to encode, and that's what got us our optimal here. So remember I was talking about that sweet spot you might encounter using this method. Well, uh, here uh, I, I found it by trial and error. I just ran this, or rather what happened is as I ran the algorithm, I didn't use this LZW variant, I used a slightly different variant. I'm sure it, it's out there in the literature somewhere, I just don't know uh, who it's credited to. Uh, but basically I ran it on all of the bit widths, 
um, or rather no bit width at all. I just let the bit width keep growing as I needed more entries in my directory. Um, and then I just computed the compression ratio for all those different bit widths. And then I compressed it using the one with the optimal compression ratio, which seems like a very uh, straightforward way to compute your bit width if you have the time to do that in compression. Okay, so I did want to uh, end this video here. Um, but in my next video, I will uh, do another example of LZW using uh, another example string um, uh, just for practice uh, performing the algorithm by hand. Um, and after that, we'll return to talking about some other uh, tree-based data structures, in particular binary search trees. All right, uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.